Hi, everybody. Welcome back or welcome to Ship It and Sip It. I'm glad to have Ethan Summers here as a guest this week. Ethan is a serial founder and currently the CEO of Xtelli, which is launched out of the Harmony Venture Labs earlier this year, just a couple of weeks ago. Ethan, how are you doing today? Doing well. Good morning or good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, very well. Uh, I'm excited to talk about Xtelli, uh, not for a lot of reasons, but first of all, we've had a, a, a lot of interesting products and product work together with Harmony Venture Labs. I Earlier, I got to talk with Trevor, the, the product manager there, in one of these interviews. It was an interesting look at the process that you guys go through, and now we're really glad to have a founder on the show. So what is the latest from Xtelli? Can you share some news? Yeah, absolutely. So Xtelli, it's at the end of the day, it's a nimble knowledge management tool. And what we're trying to do is make it really easy for teams, especially product teams, customer success teams, product operations teams, to turn what they know into visual guides that they can use, their customers can use, and they can start to collaborate back and forth on. So we're really trying to take the pain out of documenting how to do something and turning that into a relationship-based or collaborative process. And the latest for us is we launched on January 18th, I believe. So a little bit more than a month ago. Uh, we have about 100 active daily users, <clears throat> excuse me, and we actually secured our first paying customer about two weeks ago. Um, and the fun part there is they came to me and they asked the question every SaaS founder wants to be asked. They said, hey, Ethan, is it okay if we pay you for a year in advance? Which is a great way to start out with a customer. Fantastic. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of that feedback you've gotten so far on the idea and the product. Uh, but first, let's dig into your background a little bit. I looked through your LinkedIn profile. Uh, it's apparent that, that you're an Alabama guy through and through, and yeah. Harmony Venture Labs is based in Birmingham. So maybe can you share a little bit about Birmingham and uh, give your perspective on how it's evolved uh, into a sort of mini startup hub? Yeah, absolutely. And I got to say, I'm, I'm a, a child of military parents, so I've moved all over the southeast United States and um, have been, this is my fourth time living in Birmingham, actually. Um, so we were living in Atlanta, <clears throat> working you know, corporate jobs and really enjoying the community there. But I wanted to enter the venture space. And I looked up and did my homework and was very surprised. This would be 2016 or so. was very surprised to, to find what I found in Birmingham with the venture ecosystem. You know, we had this little company called Shipped coming up that people were excited about. And then in the background, there's kind of this therapy brands company that's doing well. And Daxco is the big name. Um, and what we found was that it was just a... Uh, the best small big city around for what we're doing. You know, there's a ton of community support. There's a ton of resources. There's good capital. There's a lot of talent here and creativity, but you're also not stuck in a really, really large city where everything's super expensive. And so that's what kind of lured my wife and I back here is the chance to be closer to home and be part of this venture community. And then it just exploded. Um, about a year and a half after we moved back here, Shipped was acquired for almost a half a billion dollars. We had the Daxco exit. We had the ProctorU, which is now Measure Learning exit. I'm sure I'm missing lots of small exits. And then, of course, the Therapy Brands exit. Um, so we had several half-billion-dollar events and then a billion-dollar event on top of the ongoing funding. So it's been just it's been really interesting to be here while that's happening because it's all happening right now in the city. And so it's really changing kind of the nature of, of how the city's approaching its venture ecosystem. Very cool. And I've, I've had the chance to sort of connect with some of the people yourself and, and Trevor and some of the other people that are in your networks uh, on LinkedIn, just to sort of see what's happening there. And it, and it does seem very vibrant. Everybody's sort of involved in uh, different city startup programs, different sort of business support programs. So uh, it sounds exciting for sure. Yeah, uh, uh, let's see, uh, but Xtelli is not your first uh, business. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about Fledgling and uh, what did you learn from that experience that you brought into starting Xtelli? Yeah, absolutely. So Fledging was a consumer electronics startup with a mission of making premium electronics for everyone. And what we meant is that you know, stuff like this, it's incredibly useful. It's basically required for modern life and not just for convenience, but for banking and health and transportation and work. And it's, it's horrendously expensive. Um, and so what we wanted to do was make very high quality products that worked really well and lasted a long time and then were sold at fair prices. 
Um, so I was actually hired in very early to that venture. was not a founder there, but was hired in right after we closed funding. Became CEO about a year and a half later. This is peak COVID in August of 2020 um, because of my operations background. You know, my, my professional experience is in all the back of house stuff that makes a business run for operations and finance and inventory and supply chain and those kind of problems. And that was really probably one of the biggest lessons learned with fledging. You know, we made the very difficult decision to close last year. Uh, our last day was actually just November 1st. So it's still very recent for us. Um, but just learned a ton there really in kind of two spaces of what I think about. One is keeping very, very, very tight control over where your money is. Um, not just revenue, but cash flow. Um, understanding burn rates, understanding runway, understanding realistically the time it takes to do things, even understanding things like paid ads. Really, really powerful tools for testing language, for reaching mass audiences. It's also very easy to light money on fire if you don't pay attention to it for a couple of days and suddenly you've blown out three times as much money as you wanted. I think the other big lesson more on the positive side was just around really making great products. We started out with a core product that was really technical and it wasn't something anyone wanted to have, but they had to have it, which was nice. And by the end, we had actually made this really beautiful desktop charger product called Spurs. Well-designed, very powerful, very high wattage. Um, what I would always tell people is it could charge my laptop, my tablet, my phone, my monitor, um, and the lamp on my desk all at the same time. And it fits in the palm of my hand. So we just really got to do an incredible deep dive into product design. And that's how I actually got into product was I was the operational CEO and we said, man, we've got to do this right. This is our shot. So I went out and learned just everything in the world I could about making products well. Um, and so I've been able to carry that in the Harmony Venture Labs and Excel, which has just been a treat. Interesting. Uh, I guess I didn't have this on the outline, but is there was there a big jump for you to to, to make from sort of, it sounds like fledgling was more of a hardware side uh, product line and Exteli is a, a SaaS as far as I understand. So was that a big transition for you? Yeah, there were a couple things that were really huge transitions between fledgling and Exteli and some surprising things that were just perfect matches. Um, big transitions, obviously stuff like your actual supply chain. Um, and this is where I've really enjoyed working with Parallect because I came in with just no knowledge of how software development worked. And it is, it is magical to sit down with a developer, come up with a feature, identify an issue, fix it, and then they push it and it refreshes and it just works. And if you've lived in software your entire life, I think it could maybe be easy to forget just how magical that is. But coming from a supply chain space where, you know, you order something and it could just sit on the tarmac for five to 15 days. It could just get stuck in customs for 10 to 20 days. And that's just to get a, a prototype sample. It's, it's just incredible how quickly things move here. And that's really, I think, forced me to level up how I act as a project manager um, and how I think about making lots and lots of small rolling changes versus having to essentially make one big perfect order probably been the biggest transition for me. Interesting. Uh, and I'm not sure if you know, but right now we have a new program going on for uh, new, new startup founders. It's called the Parallel Bootcamp. And we have five startups there. Most of them are solo founders, but there's one team. Uh, but they're, they're all pretty new to this and they're just feeling out. It's very early stage. Uh, I, just an idea, no MVP yet. Uh, just the landing page and idea, basically. So uh, for them, I, I'd like to ask you, uh, what what is one piece of advice you'd give to, to new people who are maybe, uh, they think they have a good idea, but they're maybe afraid or sitting on the fence uh, yeah. about taking that risk to go all in and becoming an entrepreneur? Absolutely. I'll, in typical CEO entrepreneur fashion, I'll cheat and kind of combine two into one. Um, go talk to people. And I don't mean your mom and your brother and your you know boyfriend or girlfriend or your best friend. Go talk to random people off the street. Go talk to people who could be your customers um, and get in front of them. And instead of pitching what you're doing, just ask them, explore the problem set. You know, a good example with Exteli is when I'm interviewing people, I don't even tell them what we're doing. In fact, I tell them they can't know. Um, and I say, I just want to talk about how your team is managing training, onboarding, documentation, customer relationships, that kind of a thing. Um, and the benefit to that is they're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you what they do. 
um, because you've not biased it by bringing in something you want to talk about so that they don't have to disappoint you if they tell you that they don't like your idea. So just go talk to people as quickly as you can. And the second part of that is I'd say go in with almost a scientific process mindset of prove yourself wrong. You know, what we do is risky and it's a lot of work and it costs a lot of money. And I see too many entrepreneurs go talk to three people. It's, you know, their mom, their partner, and their best friend. And they all say, we love your stuff. It's great. Go make it. And then a lot of money and time later, it wasn't a great idea. Um, So if you go in with the mentality that you should prove yourself wrong and your idea survives all those interviews and that research, it's probably a pretty good idea. Awesome. All right. Last question on your background that we'll dive into Extelli in detail. But um, I'm curious what that turning point looked like in your experience when, when you said, I want to become a CEO or I want to become a founder of a of either fledgling or, or ex telly, uh, what were some of the, excuse me, what were some of the factors that, uh, I guess, pushed you into that? Yeah, that's a great question. I was actually, of all things, a journalism student in college, and I was covering a seminar from the MBA program, and the professor there said that half of all new jobs in the United States come from startups and small businesses, and like, if light bulbs could appear in real life over heads, that would have been it. Um, and I knew, you know, I thought, I don't have an idea. I'm not a founder. I'm not the charismatic, this and that. But I could I could help those people. I could support them operationally. And so I set my career on that path. And I was watching a pitch presentation one day by the founder of Fledging. And I remember I came up to him afterwards. I was working at a local hospital in operations at the time. And I said, if I had a million dollars, I would give it to you today. And so he called me about eight months later and said, hey, we got the million dollars. Do you want to come work for me? <laughs> which I just, I loved and was a treat, but it was funny. I was not the kid who grew up, you know, selling comic books for money and mowing. I was not that. I just kind of came into operations and came into entrepreneurship. And I think it clicked for me one day when, when I understood that there is a process for this. It's not just go out and be charismatic and be really lucky and maybe have a lot of money set aside from your family there's a process you can follow to do this. And I'm a process guy. And so that just became really exciting. And that's actually when I decided to become CEO of Fledging. That's when I realized there's a process we can use for this that's going to give us a really good chance. Very cool. Well, let's dive in a little bit into that process with Extelli. Uh, it launched in January, as you said, as, uh, as a Chrome extension. And I'm curious uh, why that presentation or why that package for the product itself? Yeah. So what Extelli does is uh, you turn it on and it starts recording what you're clicking on your screen. So if I was showing someone how to do a simple process, like how to make a Google Drive folder, I would click Extelli and it starts following my clicks. It highlights each object I've clicked with a box. And then it's dumping these screenshots, these clicks and these step titles into this really well-organized guide. So in 20 or 30 seconds, I can record that guy, title it, send it to somebody, and I never have to be asked again, how do I make a Google Drive folder? Uh, For that to work for us, we needed some way to interact with someone's browser or desktop. Uh, Making desktop apps, it's on the roadmap for us, but that gets fairly complicated between Windows and Mac, you know, iOS, stuff like that, or Mac OS, excuse me. So what we wanted to do was just go to a really popular browser that has really great formatting, it's well-built, that's that's Chrome. You know, Google makes good stuff. Um, and so we wanted to make it as low friction as possible for someone to say, I have a pain. Let me go find a solution. The app, the extension, excuse me, is working right away. And from then on, all I have to remember is if I'm being asked something annoying, click the octopus, run my clicks, share the guide. I'm good to go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the octopus logo. It's lovely. Um, but when I think or when I hear knowledge management, I think about dozens of sort of documents, frameworks, spreadsheets, notion pages uh, that sort of grow grow dusty in the corners of our modern companies. Uh, so it, is that what Extelli is here to clean up? Do I have that right? That's exactly right. Um, we tried to tackle it. You know, we think that there's uh, three core activities that happen when you're managing knowledge. Um, There's creating the knowledge, there's organizing the knowledge, and then there's collaborating on the knowledge. And the reason I got excited for Excelli, you know, obviously it was an exciting opportunity to work with HVL and come work with Shagan and learn from him. 
But I said yes because of what Extel is solving. Um, I firmly believe that the way our culture is set up is you expect someone to be a subject matter expert and also a really strong communicator and also a pretty strong educator to take what's in my head and give it to you. And that's just unreasonable. So we wanted to take the communication and education gaps and shrink that as much as possible so that you and I can share information really, really quickly. And so with Extelli, we try to bring in an end-to-end -end solution. So we make creating stuff really easy. Again, a guide that takes you 10 or 15 minutes takes 30 to 40 seconds with Extelli. But that's just the entry. Once you're in, it's organized really well. Uh, we use this uh, interesting relationship of guides, collections, and learning modules so that you kind of have the tool you need, the toolbox you need, and even the full course you need without getting lost files lost in weird file structures. And then we have collaboration through learning modules, which everyone's familiar with, but also actually through a new exciting feature we're going to be releasing soon through a feedback system. And what that means is, John, if you sent me a guide and I'm seven steps in and I say, this, this doesn't look right, you know, this step's wrong. I can click a red flag, you get notified, you fix it, or you say, no, it's right. And then you push that back and I get notified that it's back. So suddenly the reader, the learner on the end of the, uh, the capture of the process is no longer just someone who's there picking up knowledge. They're also participating in the system, helping always make sure that that knowledge you have in your library is the best practice. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, so who, who's your initial target market for this? Who have you sort of talked to so far about using it? And maybe can you share some early feedback from it? Absolutely. Um, so our ICP right now uh, is a product operations team leader. Uh, they're usually in a B2B SaaS company, usually a venture, so earlier stage growth. Uh, we think they're going to be in an especially large or high growth segment. Uh, they've got a high annual customer value. And then really they're stuck in that manual chaos solution. So this is not someone coming over from maybe like a guru where their company's invested tons of time and money. This is someone who's saying, We've never actually solved this problem before. We're using Microsoft Word and Slack, and I'm just shouting down the hallway, and we use a managed inbox, and we're just cobbling it all together. And we're catching them at that moment where we're saying, hey, regardless of your title, maybe you're a customer success manager, maybe you're a product manager, maybe you're actually called product operations, it's your job to make sure that your team and your customers know how to use your product. Um, your customers are worth a lot of money, uh, your industry is worth a lot of money and the lessons learned you're, you're working through are too expensive to lose. So we come in and we say, we can be your first best solution. We're not overbuilt. Um, we're not overpriced. We are just what you need to start gobbling up that knowledge today and turning it into a resource for your team. Okay. And I, I, I wanted to break this down a little bit by sort of company size, if that makes sense. So uh, I guess who, who owns this process? Who would be the person that would set up their company's x uh, at Let's start from a, a very small startup, maybe five to 10 people. Yeah, a small startup, five to 10 people. This is going to be someone who's um, generally responsible for just the operations of the business, how stuff actually works. Um, that's typically going to either partner with or even be the person who's responsible for the product. So the head of product, the chief product officer. And then there's a good bit of overlap with customer success. Now on five to 10 person teams, you don't tend to have those three distinct roles. You tend to have a head of product or a CSM or a head of ops who's actually doing all those three things at once. Okay. Uh, and if the company is growing and say from 20 to 100 people, that's when you really tend to see the roles get broken out and it, it'll stop being a head of product as much because their job stops being as operational and starts being more uh, analytical and making new product. It really then falls into whoever's responsible for the customer experience or um, we're seeing more and more of the rise of the product operations role. You'll see a head of order operations, a head of product operations, that kind of a thing. We think that's going to be the sweet spot. All right. And the last one I've listed, I'm not sure if it really qualifies as big or not, but a company of more than 200 people. Uh, our hope is that it falls very firmly into the operation space at that point. You know, that's where the rubber meets the road. And in a SaaS company, if you're in charge of operations or your team is, it's really up to you to make sure that teams are trained, customers are trained, 
you know, the real life of product is meeting the real life of the customer experience. All right. And I guess in a setting like that, my next question would be, I mean, we have a pretty small uh, marketing team here in Parallect. Is this something that I, as sort of an, a knowledge manager of the content side of the marketing team, uh, w could go into Extelli and say, hey, this is how we want to sort of structure uh, our workflows a little bit more so that I can share that more easily? Is that uh, a, a good use case for Extelli as well? Absolutely. You know, what? everything I was just talking about is that ideal customer persona, that perfect one. But we see teams, you know, do a lot of interesting stuff with it. For instance, we're talking with Harley Davidson's uh, Global Trade Group, and, you know, they're strictly internal. They're not talking to external customers at all. But what they want to do with Extelli is take this huge multinational compliance process they have. Instead of it being scattered across an old Excel file with tabs, they're going to format it in Extelli guides and learning modules so that you can jump in and out with links and screenshots and everything you need is in this shared experience. And that's what Extelli does, is at the end of the day, it creates a shared experience for your teams and customers. So it's very powerful for, say, a marketing team to say not just, are we doing everything the same way? But also something new, weird, interesting comes up. You can say, hey, everybody, come look at this. And then you say, oh, this is a good new best practice. Let's go update our content. Everyone's on the same page again and having that same shared experience. Very cool. I'll have to give it a shot. All right. Uh, I want to go back a little bit, though, to the beginning of the Extelli idea itself. Uh, did it start with Harmony Venture Labs and then you came and joined, or did you bring the idea to them? How did that happen? Yeah, so it was really kind of an opportune moment. Last summer, Harmony Venture Labs had an open house, and they talked about these three ideas and problems they were working on. Um, and one of the problems, it was just a problem statement. They said it's hard for busy executives to share what they know. Um, and that really appealed to me because I was a busy executive trying to shut down a business and move all this knowledge over. And it's, it's hard. And I'm, again, trained as a journalist. I write for fun. I'm very good at this. And it's still super hard. Um, and then they had this other concept about um, using artificial intelligence to turn uh, podcasts into very realistic uh, transcripts. And so the thought kind of occurred to me, what if you take those two approaches and you say, it's too hard for executives to share what they know. How can we use technology to shrink that gap? And that's really where the concept came from. So I think we came up with it very much together. Uh, Trevor and I texted back and forth for a few days, and then I came in and talked with Shagan and the team, and we wrapped around an idea pretty quickly that is now fairly similar to the core idea of Extelli. Fantastic. And I did talk a little bit with Trevor about the advantages of, for the founders of launching out of a venture studio like Harmony Venture Labs. Um, I guess I wanted to get your perspective on it. How does this sort of change the, your dynamic as the, the leader of the company or as the CEO to have their backing and sort of that broader support at the early stage of product? That's a great question. Um, early on, one of the mental models I learned is uh, networks, knowledge, and capital. So, you know, what's your network look like? You know, who do you know? Knowledge is what do you know or what can you find out? And capital is obviously cash. And I think those are the three core advantages that uh, Harmony Venture Labs brings. If you look at starting a, a venture by yourself or with, you know, your closest friends, your network is just very dependent on who the two or three of you know. Um, and especially if that's your first venture, that that's tough. Uh, knowledge is entirely dependent on what the two or three you know and what you can find online and find from people. And I think what's missing with that is context. So it, there's a world of entrepreneurial education out there. Where do you focus? And then obviously access to capital. Um, and Harmony really brings all those very, very strongly. Um, incredible network, a network I was able to integrate with and add my network to. So we just mutually reinforcing. Um, incredible knowledge base, you know, with Shagan as the founder who led a billion dollar exit, obviously it's, its foundation is very strong, but then you have the team here who are each experts in their own field and then what they don't know, they find out quickly. Um, and then access to capital, you know, the capital needed for the MVP to have a reasonable runway and then ongoing access to capital when we establish traction and need to raise another round. Those are all problems, each of which can completely kill a really valid startup idea. 
And those are all problems that are pretty much solved right away by being in a venture studio. Right. And I guess the, I guess it allows you as the CEO to really focus on sales and marketing instead of maybe if you're more cash strapped, you would have to spend a lot more time trying to network among investors, angel investors, really try and get that ball rolling. And it would take up a lot more of your time. Uh, I, I agree with all that. And I'd add to that, I think it also gives us a little more breathing room to really find the best customer. Um, and of course, there's a balance there because we don't want to be too relaxed. But when you're paying for everything on your own dime and you've told your wife, I'm going to give this six months of effort, <laughs> you know, you got to kind of take what's there. And I think that leads a lot of early founders to customers who pay some bills, but maybe aren't the best customer. Um, and that sounds funny to people if it's your first time, but the the freedom to the privilege really to, to find that best customer and connect with them early is just a really, really huge advantage for us. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And we've talked about Shagan a little bit, but uh, he has been sharing over the past sort of six months, maybe a year almost already, in his Let's Build newsletter. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, a lot of his advice, what he learned from building therapy brands, what he learned from launching the, the subsequent startups like uh, Extelli. Uh, do you have any particular reflections on working together with him to build Extelli, anything that he really uh, impacted the way that you take on the product? Absolutely, yeah. And I'm, I'm really fortunate. Shagan was an investor in my previous company as well. So, and I've been able to just have that relationship with him for a while and, and learn from him. He's an incredible resource to learn from. And I cannot possibly recommend his newsletter enough. It's, it's uh, such a great resource. I think the place where he does the best job challenging is he does a really good job of, of challenging into focus while also saying you need to hold the broad strategy in mind. And those are both hard things to do. It's hard to focus well, and it's hard to hold kind of the future of the next three months, nine months, two years, five years in mind. And he does a really good job pushing me and pushing us to dive a mile deep into an extremely specific you know, customer persona or an ad campaign and really be extremely tactical, but then draw a line all the way back up through the learning process, through the mapping process up to how does this help us create a billion dollar success? And it's hard to describe until you've been in a room with them on my whiteboard, but he just makes it seem so here's just the process you follow. All right. Uh, that's, a, that's awesome. Uh, but it, it paints a very positive picture. And I guess, uh, a follow-up question to that would be, you guys started Extelli sort of last summer-ish? That- yeah, the I mean, people started on August 15th. Okay. Uh, and that was sort of the, the, I guess you could say, the end of the good times in terms of uh, the, the startup bull run. Uh, and you've launched now in January, which is sort of the middle of, of the winter. Uh, but ha- how has that market changed and dynamic impacted sort of the way that you built the product or the way that you thought about uh, the potential for businesses to want to to buy the solution from you? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I think one of the things I'd bring in is, is an efficiency perspective for my operations time, you know, capital efficiency, process efficiency. And that's something in the DNA of Harmony Venture Labs too, is being very capitally efficient. So I don't think it was ever our plan to go have infinite access to series B and C and D and Z cash just to keep growing. We wanted to be able to be efficient as we grew. On the Extelli side, I think it's actually a boon for us. And I I say that really carefully because I know a lot of people have been impacted by this shift in the market and uh, it's, it's awful. You know, no one wants to be laid off. No one wants their venture to shut down. So I'm not happy that that's happened to them. But what Extelli does is it really institutionalizes lessons learned. And like I said, it creates that shared experience. And so I think that's the kind of thing, especially for our price point and how easy we are to implement, that becomes a have to have for early ventures. You know, those lessons you're learning right now from customers and product interviews, those product pushes, those product features that you're pushing, each one of those is critical. Um, And it needs to be documented. It needs to be the common language for the team. It needs to be the common language for your customers so that you can stay in the game. I think Extelli becomes kind of a super tool 
um, for small and medium stage ventures, especially as they're scaling, is it's so easy to start losing all those lessons learned. And that's the biggest mistake you can make. There's You spend too much time and money learning those lessons, not to turn them into how your team does things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Uh, obviously, I can't uh, miss the opportunity to ask you about your experience of working with your team here at Parallel, yeah. uh, since that's my side of the things. Uh, so what are some highlights? Uh, what, maybe you can highlight some challenges that you've been through together that that brought you to this point. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> that was that was probably my biggest fear coming in is I never managed SaaS. I, I never managed developers. I'm a commercial founder. I, you know, I'm not a technical founder. So on my mind was my first hire is going to be a CTO or head of technology who's going to like take this technology pain away from me so I can go focus on product and marketing and sales and people. <clears throat> and I was just, I've been really, really enjoying the experience with Parallel. Um, and I know that kind of sounds like the right thing to say on an interview, but it was something I was just so openly afraid of. And it's just, it's been great. You know, some of the stuff I really appreciate about the team is how structured they are, how creative they are how well laid out the process is. So we know, you know, we're getting an MVP in two months and we're doing stand-ups three times a week. We're doing requirements capture. You know, we I've got perfect visibility into what's going on. So really, I think really strong project management um, is typically missing with dev shops that I understand. And Parallel does a really strong job of it. Super. Uh, was there anything you sort of learned along the way? Because there's a significant time difference, I guess, and it's clearly a remote team. So uh, how, how have you sort of worked in that setting? That's been a little bit of a layup for me. Um, previously, we worked with manufacturers out of Shenzhen in Beijing, China. So that was 12 to 13 hours difference. Um, the language gap is, is significantly more advanced than between Eastern Europe in the United States. So for me, it's actually been a little bit of a vacation to come in and say, I've got you for a couple hours in the morning. You'll do your work. I'll come in the morning and see what you've done. And I'm not up at night at night so that I can catch you on the phone at 8 a.m. Um, right. So it's been, it's been pretty smooth. Cool. All right. Well, I'm glad to hear all of that. And uh, I'm curious now what uh, kind of feedback, you've mentioned a little bit of this before, but uh, for founders that maybe have just launched their MVP in a similar situation as you, uh, w what types of feedback are you focused on collecti collecting uh, from your early customers? I think it depends a lot on where you are, um, kind of in your product development process and your business development process. If you're really early and you haven't spent any money or it's still really enough time to change things, uh, diving into customer discovery is important. And there's a whole body of literature on that, so I won't refresh all of it. But essentially, you're trying to answer the question, what are customers actually doing today to solve this problem you think exists? And what you'll see is that if they're not actually doing anything today, it's probably not a real problem, or you're not talking to the right customer. Um, as your product matures and develops, you want to be shifting a little bit more into kind of demos, not for sales, but for showing off little bits of what you've built or maybe stuff you've simulated using Figma to start to get their response. And what you're really looking for, again, is what are they actually doing? Um, I don't know how it is um, kind of in the European market, but in the southern United States, we're, we have a politeness problem. Uh, we're very polite. We're very nice to people, which means it's sometimes hard to get someone to say, hey, Ethan, I don't like your product. Um, and so what you want to look for is what are they actually doing with it? You know, if you set 10 customers up as beta users and three of them log in first day and use it every day and seven of them never log in or use it once, you've got to let those seven go or go find out why they were engaged. And you've got to dial in on the three who are actually doing something, even if they're not who you thought they'd be. You know, a good example is one of the initial customer personas we focused on was sales teams. They responded really, really strongly to using this to making sales collateral and capturing what's going on and telling the product team what's wrong and yada, yada. I've got a, a long list of interviews from sales teams that were really excited and none of them actually came back and participated in the beta or did trials. Customer success teams were less excited up front. They all participated in the trials um, and so did anyone with an operations responsibility. So kind of sorting out what people are saying from what they're actually doing 
is the best advice I could give someone. You want to be looking at what are they actually doing either today or with your product. Interesting. Uh, all right, let's move on, I guess, to the future and uh, just wrap it up here. Uh, what does success look like for Extelli in the next six to 10 months? In the next six to nine months? Um, yeah, six to 10. Definitely well-established traction. You know, we want to have um, many paying customers. I think we're aiming for probably 100 in the next six months or so. And then we want to have lots and lots of active daily users. So with a typical account, one paying customer has five authors. as people who can make stuff, edit stuff. And then unlimited learners, that's people who can see your content. You know, we'd want to see something like 100 paying customers and then 500 to 1,000, maybe more people jumping in and out, looking at guides, completing learning modules, that kind of a thing. So for us, I think that would really help us confirm we've got a pretty good grasp on early product market fit. And it puts us in a good position if we need to, to go raise money, especially like you mentioned in a tougher fundraising environment on the basis of we've got strong fundamentals, we've got clean product market fit, we've got really good unit economics, here's our customer base, we've got great partnerships for stuff like development, please invest in us. Awesome. What is one thing that you used to believe very strongly, but have recently changed your mind about? And it can be about products and startups, or it can be about leadership, or it can be any of your choice. That's a really good question. Um, and I, I, stole know, it, I stole it from another podcaster. I don't know if I want to answer it, but it's a good question. Um, something that's really changed. On the product side, I think that we've had this maybe five-year moment where people wanted to build the smallest, most specific product possible. And then it became the, the consumer's job, the user's job to stitch it all together. Um, and you see with, with Zapier's success, you know, Zapier works to, to automate and integrate all those little products. The fact that there's now a third tier market for integrating tons of little products to avoid solving a main market problem says it is complicated. And so I believe that customers actually want more of a guided experience. I don't think they want to be kind of locked in, but I do think they want you to bring in some best practices. They want you to kind of structure them through how to do something. And they're a little bit tired of having like a whiteboard or a sandbox to play with. They're more looking for, if I knew how to manage knowledge, I wouldn't be paying for your product. Tell me how to do this, if that makes sense. And that's, that's a change for me because I grew up in the era of there's a tiny little niche product for everything. So I'm, I'm kind of relearning. Right. It's, it's sort of that it's cycle right. of uh, bundling and unbundling. Mm -hmm. Just That's uh, right. So it keeps going. Absolutely. All right. Uh, let's say we, we decide to come over uh, and visit the HVL headquarters in yeah. Birmingham. Uh, what is one thing that you'd, you'd like to, us to see or do there? Man, that's a good one. There's a lot of great stuff in Birmingham. Um, there's kind of one of everything. Like I said, I came from Atlanta, big city. We were expecting to lose some things when it came to Birmingham. We just lost having 10 of them. There, there's one of everything, which we love. My favorite thing in town is probably Red Mountain Park. It's uh, um, Birmingham's right at the end of the Appalachian Mountains. Very iron and coal heavy. That's why we were such a steel city. Um, and Red Mountain is just this iron-filled mountain. It's about 1,500 acres of a private park that you can run and hike and walk all over. Views of the city, walk straight up to great food. You can get from downtown to Red Mountain in 10 minutes. It's got professional mountain biking paths. I mean, it's got something for everybody. And it's just this hidden treasure 10 minutes from downtown Birmingham. And I absolutely love it. Very cool. I'd love to check it out. Yeah. I was in Birmingham uh, seven years ago or so. Well, uh, but just for a week, we were uh, rebuilding houses after there was a tornado nearby Birmingham. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I was working with the, with an aid organization doing some rebuilding there. Yeah. Thank you for that work. Yeah. It, it was fun. Uh, but I didn't get to see much of the city and I didn't get to go mountain biking. But next time, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So... Uh, you already teased one of the upcoming features, but is, is there anything else coming up from Extelli in the near future that you'd like to leave our listeners with? 
Uh, yeah. So the feature I teased was the the feedback system. That'll be in the next month or so, where you can just red flag a step, tell the author it's wrong, which is pretty unique for uh, documentation. A couple other things we're working on: the ability to have multiple libraries. So maybe you have internal to your team and external to your customers, and you can push and pull documents across there. Or maybe you have the sales team and the marketing team. It just gives you that flexibility. And what's fun about it is instead of moving guides over, you kind of assign guides to it. So it's not an either or experience. It's a yes and experience for people saying the same knowledge. Um, and then co-branding. You know, we really thought people were going to want white labeling, but they want co-branding. So you're going to be able to add your logo, your color, your tagline, your URL, and then have a little powered by Xteli uh, logo merged with yours on the header and the footer. So you can start to professionalize say for your own customers, your own team, um, here's our brand. Um, it is represented well in a great UI. And then here's the the partner company, Excelly, that's helping us do this. Very cool. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing that come to fruition and I look forward to trying out the tool as well. I haven't quite gotten around to it yet, uh, but thank you so much, Ethan, for your time. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners before we close up? I got to say, shameless plug, but I love the Parallax team. You know, for someone who came in, no SaaS experience, little development experience, worried about the technology side, the Parallax team has just de-risked it. They communicate well. They made it really, really easy for me to learn. Um, they put up with my dumb questions, and when they need to, they come back to me and then they say, Ethan, stop it. That's too much. Um, and that's just a really healthy relationship to have, especially with outsource partner. Awesome. Well, I'm sure your team will be very glad to hear that. I know I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we're all glad to hear that. So thank you so much. Uh, and have a lovely weekend. You as well. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye.